All right, welcome to the Blue Ox Running Podcast, number 16. It's our Sweet 16 podcast today. Uh, we're talking all things shoes. That's right, we're going to go through our March podcast because this time of the year, a lot of people are getting outside. They're getting out and running more than they might have in the winter. Um, I know a lot of people run all through the winter, but today we're going to talk shoes, primarily shoes, 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 anything that you could think of when it comes to getting in the right running or walking shoe, different brands, different drops, different cushions, different stability, different technology. We're going to talk a lot about carbon plated racing shoes that has changed lately. But first, we want to get a word of the day from Alicia. And uh, what is your word of the day? It is March 2023. I thought it's February. <laughs> We're releasing this in March. Okay. It's the last day of February. Now everyone knows our process. <laughs> What's your word of the day? <laughs> um, ski. As prepared as we always are, it never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> Intro's going good. Here's the theme song. <laughs> so what's your spring running goal? Qualify for the Boston Marathon. Claim the beer mile title. Training for a triathlon. 20 minutes again under a, in a 5K. To run happy. Balance running and family. Finish Grandma's Marathon. Do not die. <laughs> fast, 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 fast. Or slow. Let's go! Faster, slow! Let's go! Faster, slow! Let's go! All right, we are back from the theme song. <clears throat> Podcast number 16 is all about shoes, but first, I guess we're going to talk about skis. Like, Alicia, why is your word of the day skis? We want to talk about shoes. Well, Berkey just happened. Yes, it did. Absolutely. So that's always a fun time of year for me to reminisce because my parents grew up doing it. But then also, which is new for me, we've been taking our kids downhill snowboarding adam has skied yeah i grew up skiing downhill a little bit more than anyone in our family so i still get the skis so i can actually do something helpful and help the kids but they're all snowboarding and why is it new for you what are you doing (laughs) i'm just sitting in the chalet (laughs) i will share that i was like you know cautious i'm training for a race i'm like (laughs) i'm not gonna go skiing and injure myself and i'm sitting helping my son get his bindings on at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. And I just get pelted by a kid. She got pummeled. In the side of my knee by a snowboard. Yeah. And the but reason, I'm okay. The reason you're not skiing or snowboarding isn't only because you no. have a race coming up. I am fearful of skiing. Yeah. She's got some past trauma, would we call it that? Some past bad experiences. And she's going to get over that fear by the time she's dead, maybe. But... Last weekend was not the weekend to put her back on skis. And in fact, the kids need a lot of help. They're learning snowboarding. They got to be put in the bindings. It's a whole thing. I took them all by myself the first time and they liked it. But we're kind of seeing what that means to have a family activity like that. It's fun to try something new. Yeah, for sure. it's super fun to try something new. And it actually relates to running and training cycles a little bit where it's a good time of the year to try different things. My quads definitely get a different workout. I mean, it's not like it's the same as going out and running 20 miles, but I actually did a long run that morning. I think I ran 24 miles. And then uh, that afternoon I was skiing and I could definitely tell the quads are a little bit on fire the next day. So it's just a different movement. Um, It's a different activity. We're not going to have the snow forever. It's good to break up the year. It kind of relates back to episode Mm -hmm. 15 when we talked about different seasons and different activities so go listen to that if you haven't yet that was all about winter training winter running different seasons doing different things and getting your training cycles set but today we're going to talk about shoes shoes. all right today we're going to talk about shoes we have a lot that we could go through because we are a shoe store we are a retail store in eau claire wisconsin we could talk forever about shoes but we do have a little bit of a plan to get to get people even introduced into this world of running shoes because a lot of people just don't know the different categories and everything that we're looking at. We do a personalized gait analysis. But Alicia was in the running industry before I was. Uh, When we moved out east to the D.C. area, I had my first job out of grad school and Alicia got a job at uh, the local running store out there. That's where we fell in love with uh, specialty run retail at Potomac River Running. And tell us how different or the same the footwear and the trends were back in 2006, 2007 timeframe? Around that time. I mean, there's, excuse me, a lot I could touch on. Um, 
first, I will say that, you know, if anyone knows shoes, the Hoka Bondi is kind of like that medical doctor recommended shoe. Not always, but it is. And back in my day at Potomac River Running, that shoe for sure was a motion control shoe, which we actually don't even carry a motion control control shoe on our shoe wall. Um, So that was really different of putting people in like this max stability, really rigid shoe. Now we have transitioned to put in max cushion. Um, And then also, it's just so funny because like there was still stability and neutral in those same same categories. But um, like the topic of color, like there just wasn't the options because in reality, the shoe, the adrenaline here probably has 30 colors. No joke. And I remember it was a big deal that we had two to three. And this was a seven location store as well. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of followed different trends of fashion. So like the shoe industry isn't just the actual, you know, footwear on your feet. It's also um, where fashion goes and, and different consumers and different markets. Um, and so, yeah, the colors on shoes have exploded mm-hmm. like exponentially. I do remember that phase too, where it was like, they're like white and blue. You had the white and blue yeah. color and then you had the gray and red one. With and a little then, silver. <laughs> yeah. And then you had like the dark black shoe that was a trail shoe. Like that was kind of it. Um, so that's one thing that's changed the motion control, like the way that shoes and different, even brands will do stability nowadays. Um, it has, has certainly changed. And then that pendulum, I think of back, back in those days, there was a huge swing towards minimalism and even like barefoot running. And, you know, some people still go in and out of that, but there was a huge trend on minimalism. And now the trend seems to be the pendulum comes back closer to super high max cushion shoes. And um, I mean, we just want to talk about that and how there can actually be a lot of good information. And, and, and sometimes the change is good. And sometimes there's a ton of misinformation, especially when it comes to the internet, people talking about their experience. Um, and uh, we wanted to talk through that today. Yeah, when I was on my way out, I think it was in 2011. Um, there's like, yeah, the, everyone was talking about barefoot running and very minimal, no cushion shoes. Like I just think of the New Balance Minimus was right. huge. Like I even had a pair of them. Um, I have a pair right now, but we'll we'll yes. I'll share I'll share later why I have a pair and when I actually use them. Go ahead. Yeah. So no, just like that's another huge change. It feels like there's so much cushion now in shoes. Yeah. So we want to talk through these things. There's kind of that pendulum that we always want to keep in mind. And that's the same. It doesn't have to be shoes. It doesn't have to be running. That's the same in a lot of sports and a lot of fashion, a lot of trends that are kind of always going in and out. Things kind of loop back to um, how they used to be maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And I'm sure that we'll see that pendulum kind of swing back where maybe the super high cushion, um, high platform shoes aren't the best for um, the marathon runners or, or who knows, like they all have their time and place. And we just, we want to be helpful in that conversation because there is a lot of categories. Um, yeah, we do our podcast in the store. And so if you're watching this on the video, you see our shoe, part of our shoe all anyway, and it can actually be intimidating for people to come in and see this whole mass of shoes, even though it's colorful and it's cool looking and we organize them a certain way. Our job is to basically eliminate 90% of that shoe wall and get people um, trying on shoes that are only going to be helpful, not just for their foot, but how they're going to use them, right? So um, Alex, anything? Alex is our producer here. He's our media head. Um, anything that you want to contribute first? When you first got into running, how are your shoes different then and how are they to what you're in right now? Yeah. Um you know, and how long ago was that? Sorry. Well, it would have been probably like cross country or, or track, I guess, in like middle school. Yep. Um, never really paid too much mind to what I was putting on my feet. Certainly back then. Um, yep. When I was, you know, young and and just pliable and just I could really put my body through anything. I felt like and didn't really matter what was on my feet. Um, you know, I think just as a kid, kind of being exposed to just what was available, I think like Nike was the one brand that, you know, kind of gravitated to. Um, and then certainly when uh, kind of came um, came to the point of training for first marathon was when you guys were opening. Yeah. Like really like the first, like that, like a month before my first marathon was when Blue Ox opened their store. Um, 
kind of did the a little bit of the the, the gate analysis and um, wound up. This is probably the third time I'll bring up uh, the the Sockety Kinvara Eight. Yep. that was uh, that was my marathon shoe. Um, and actually, it's funny because even like honing on on that specific model, that shoe has changed. Yep. tremendously since mm-hmm. um, since then. Um, I felt like I actually put it on my foot the other day and it felt much more cushioned. Um, and I mean, just the nuance of how even just within 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 a single brand, you hone in on a, on one model of shoe and you see all the different iterations of it and how that pendulum is kind of always swinging. Right. It's really it's really cool. It's interesting. Well, Alicia, I mean, we both ran in college and honestly, I didn't have decent looking back, I did not have decent good footwear. I had really flexible kind of minimal trainers, but I I feel like I could kind of get away with it and I didn't get injured because I have a really neutral, almost like a supinating gait where I'm on the outside of my feet. Um, I run on my toes quite a bit to where my heels didn't take any injuries or anything like that. But you had a little different experience where you, you didn't really realize that you weren't in the right shoe and then you got in the right shoe until you were working after college. Right. I got in the right shoe at Potomac River Running. Um, prior to that, same thing. I remember I could fold my shoes like in half right. and like running pretty decent high miles in college on that, who's someone that like pretty severely over pronates. Yep. Um, and just like Alex, I think I could get away with it for a time being like just being light and young in high school but then even my senior year of high school I had developed um, stress fractures on both of my legs Um, and even then there was just no resources where I grew up like a shoe store so I got fit in these really thick orthotics which felt horrible and my shoes and were hundreds of dollars and I'm not saying there's a there's definitely a place for orthotics I'm not saying that but for me going from a flexible shoe and then so I started working at Potomac River Running and they fit me and they're like oh you just need some stability and it was like game changing for like I'm like that customer that comes in that's like you have changed my life like I don't have this pain anymore and I had that same experience like I haven't had any major injury since I have been in the right shoe yeah Yeah, that's good. I mean, we want to talk a little bit about, I mean, we don't have to describe every single thing that we're looking at in the gait analysis. Like if you have never been fit, come on in. We'll we'll talk shoes all day long with you. There, a lot of people do know now um, there's kind of this neutral category and stability category, you know, and that's kind of what we're looking for, for a baseline. But then, um, I mean, we wrote down some other things that go into what category of shoe that people are actually in. It, It has to do with um, you know, like performance or race day shoes. If you're on the trail, there's hybrid shoes that are like road to trail. They'd be good for either roads or trails. There's spikes. There's, and a lot of things have changed in the last few years, especially with that fast performance category, Mm -hmm. like the fast performance category, even in marathons, my first marathons, I was wearing a pretty minimal, um, racing flat. And if you look at like the, the world-class and even just like marathon runners, in the early 2000s and even 2010, 2015, it's before these super shoes, super high stack um, stack levels came through. And now we have the carbon plating, right? We've got the plated shoes, we got the synthetic plates, and there's a whole uh, physics and research that's going into essentially propulsion and, and how that affects the shoe and, and what pace that's appropriate for. But it used to just be faster shoes have less cushion and they're snappy and uh, kind of the higher cushion shoes were soft and a little bit clunkier but now it's not that simple yeah one thing um you didn't hit on is like the heel to toe as well like it used to be pretty classic of like that 10 to 12 millimeters and maybe i just didn't know because i was like a staff worker but there seems to be so many different brands that like play around with different um heel to toe yep um like stack height yep so um what has been What's a shoe that you wear now that you ne- wasn't even on the market back, you know, 10 years ago that is helpful for you in a specific context? Yeah, I could name a couple. Um, I really like the Saucony Tempest. And then I rotate in a Hoka Arahi too, which Hoka wasn't even around when I was in the run. Yep. 
specialty. And I think, I think of the Tempest as kind of this, in, we just we just brought in the Tempest by Saucony and we really like it because it's a high cushion stability shoe, like Alicia needs stability. Um, you still do the Adrenaline, you still do mm-hmm. the 860, you still do, you know, that classic um, Glycerin GTS um, is what they call the high cushion Brooks now. So there's a lot that hasn't changed, like your daily trainers, but the Tempest is a little different where they put that that bouncier performance foam in a higher cushion trainer. And so it's a little bit more energetic. Is that right? Right. And you don't see that very much with a stability shoe. Right. So that's why like, I really like that option because it's like stability, like high cushion, but it has that more responsive cushioning in it. Yep. So we're starting to touch on something that I feel like has changed quite a bit in the last uh, three to five years, which is not just, oh, am I neutral? Am I stable? And then how much cushion do I need? It's like within cushioning, within just the, it's not just the amount of cushioning, it's the compound of cushioning. So like the cushion compound could literally be different in this shoe, which is uh, for those of you that are just listening, we've got the Saucony Tempest, which actually has a little bit more of a bouncy performance cushion compound, but it's still a high cushion uh, running shoe. And then like the the A6 Gel Keanu is still a great shoe. It's been around forever. They put gel you know, in a lot of the A6 shoes. So the actual compound and what the cushioning is made of, um, I think there's a huge wide variety that people might not be aware of. They ju- they're just kind of thinking neutral or stability. And then what's the amount of cushion I need? And that's all relevant, but the cushion compound and what the cushion is made of and meant to do is also relevant because we're seeing a lot higher stack heights with bouncier performance uh, cushion compounds. Uh, What shoe did you run your marathon in? Um, The Saucony, Saucony, that's how you say it. Saucony um, Endorphin Speed. Yes. <clears throat> Killer. And that's got the same cushion compound race day shoe as the Tempest, actually. Correct. And it, it's not a true um, carbon plate. So it's got a plate in it, but it's that synthetic. So it's not quite as high priced as a true um, carbon plate. And it's also not quite as rigid. Mm-hmm. Like you've, you've put on and tried other plated shoes as well. And you just wanted something that has a little bit more give. Like not all carbon plate plated shoes are the same. And... Um, the discussion, I'll, I'll say it again, a lot of times people are focusing on the plate, but it's also the cushion compound that we need to consider when it comes to the feel of a shoe, right? Alex, have you um, come in? I mean, the Saucony Kinvar has been around forever, and that's kind of what you did your marathon in. What's a, a shoe or a category that you're in now that you didn't used to be or didn't kind of used to be around? What's newer? Um, well, the higher, the higher cushion shoes are definitely... Um, kind of where a lot of my um, my miles are put into uh, lately just because I'm doing higher mileage stuff um, they definitely higher mileage shoes definitely uh, lend themselves more to like the recovery aspect of just you know if you're doing back-to-back long runs training for an ultra you're you're kind of stacking your long runs and running on tired legs uh, you want something that has a little bit more um, a little more cushion underfoot so all that impact is, you know, getting dispersed a little differently than if I was in, you know, a, a racing shoe or, a, you know, a, a more, a lighter cushioned alternative. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, to be honest, there's a whole population of people that really lean towards one side of the spectrum that would um, downplay everything we're saying about support and cushion. And um, there's books out there and there's kind of a following and there's there's different tribes of thought when it comes to even if a no, you know more cushion is helpful and support and some people think it's very unnatural. And we, we hear some of that coming in and we want to be a place where we're educating people because there are nuggets of truth in all of these different kind of beliefs with what's appropriate for a, for a running shoe, right? And um, the barefoot running craze came through. It swept through America. (laughs) It's really cool and trendy to kind of like, you know, run on a trail barefoot or maybe with these little thin sandals. And um, there's actually a time and a place to strengthen your feet, to strengthen your Achilles, to strengthen your calf um, and to run in less shoe. I actually prefer to run in less than more. Um, 
but at the end of the day, what's what what are we considering natural? You know, what what might be natural for someone in East Africa that's grown up since the age of four and has walked to school in their grade school years on a dirt road that's barefoot, and they're able to run no problem 10 to 12 miles a day in their teen years barefoot, and then all of a sudden they're 35 years old and they can kind of still do the barefoot minimal thing. That's a totally different experience over the course of decades than growing up in America and walking on sidewalks and having shoes on your feet your whole life. You know, like you just can't all of a sudden switch to the Vibram five fingers and, and run down the road on the concrete <laughs> training for your first marathon in minimal shoes that you're just going to break down. And that's not an offense to anyone. That's just a physical reality that we saw like follow the barefoot running craze was a ton of injuries and actually a lawsuit on some of these companies. So it, it is definitely hard to, to kind of wade through the nugget of truth that's in there and then kind of the um, how people take it, which is to generalize and say this is the right way and this is the wrong way, when in fact there might be different ways to do this in the right context. I had a barefoot week. <laughs> my life I was living oh, where you were running and I, I was I was living in Minneapolis for a week yeah and it was like literally when it would, would have been like the mid 2000s oh yeah be, for like, sure yeah you know? totally yeah and uh born to run is a is a book that's great to be honest and that that influenced a lot of the a lot of people a lot of the stuff and some yes. of the people that love that book hate running stores like ours honestly they they don't agree with the gate analysis or the support mm -hmm. um but I think they take it a little too far to generalize everyone in that. But what oh, did yeah. you do back oh, then? Gosh. I mean, I ran through the, the, I literally ran through the streets of Minneapolis without, without shoes. Yeah, and dude. I remember when I pulled the plug is when I, when I got home and I, I, I mean, ha who hasn't done that? <laughs> I mean, were you, you know, were you out for a run or just running around? I, I wanted to, I wanted to see what it was about yeah. like, to see if it actually uh, had any, any merit. And I mean, in that context of running on on hard concrete and like through dirty streets, like yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I remember getting home and like seeing uh, like a <laughs> a beer bottle in your heel. <laughs> it was literally a safety pin <laughs> yeah, like sticking God, sticking gross. out of my big toe, and I was like, "Yeah, not doing this anymore." <laughs> right, context. Con I mean, some people might say I'm a hypocrite because they might have seen me at Lowe's Creek walking barefoot during my recovery, and I'm not kidding about this. Like, I would warm up and I. Would would need to get all these different muscles activated for this pelvis injury that I had and barefoot movement was part of that and I actually have a pair of uh, minimus M10s that are like super minimal that I wear in the gym because I like to feel the floor more when I'm when I'm lifting weights and when I'm doing different exercise machines yes I do the rowing machine yes I do the stair stepper as part of my recovery and I don't need a, a higher cushion shoe for that so there is a time and a place for every single kind of shoe that's made out there there's a time and a place but it's not for everybody on every run that they're ever going to do on every surface that's what I'm trying to say yeah, I wanted to share because I have fit many people in here that want like a really minimal shoe. And I want to just what we're talking about, like, that's OK. We're going to work with you. Yes. Like we our main thing is we listen to what you want. It's not like you're going to come in here. We're like, no, 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 you can't wear a minimal shoe. Right. You and you can some people can do that. Like like Adam was saying, there's a time and place for it all. And if that's what you're looking for, we have that here too. Like that. Yeah. Another thing that we come across all the time, because there's so, what we're trying to get across is there's so much that goes into making, you know, this shoe, this shoe. There's the brand, there's the drop, there's the support, there's the amount of cushion, there's the compound of cushion, there's the toe box width, there's all these different preferences that aren't like a right or wrong thing. It's just some people have a narrower foot. They actually might gravitate towards Mizuno and Asics, which run a little bit narrower. Some people can't get away from the ultra uh, wider toe box like there's all these different things and um, sometimes what we'll hear is someone has a bad experience in a shoe um, or they it's not even them to be honest it's like my aunt uh, was running in asics and then she switched to brooks and now all of her all of our injuries were solved and so they come in on secondhand advice um, secondhand experience and they're really just focusing on this brand piece and i need to know more information and, and it totally could be they're comparing apples to apples, and the only thing that's different was um, Asics to Brooks. Honestly, at that point, it's still their their aunt's foot. But sometimes we have this uh, this bias in our mind before we 
before we even start experiencing shoes. Um, and it could it could totally be an apples to oranges thing where she went from Asics that was high cushion neutral um, to a Brooks that was mid cushion stability, you know, and the stability piece, it wasn't really the brand, but the stability piece really was helpful for her. So we're here to help kind of like navigate and narrow down what has been helpful, what hasn't been helpful, because there's not just like one or two things going on. There's like five or six or seven things going on. And it's, and it's different for each person for sure. Yeah. I was going to say, we get a lot of people like the hot brand right now, I would say is Hoka. And a lot of doctors will recommend that. But something that's unique about them is they have that meta rocker bottom. And so we have a lot of people and they're great. Like we all wear them here. Um, They are a great brand. But that that rocker is not for everyone. And so I think people just come in being like, I want a Hoka because my aunt has it or whatever we're talking about. And sometimes they definitely leave with a Hoka, but to get it on your foot and because some of these brands do have a little bit different technology to them um, that they end up with a Brooks or Saucony, whatever it is. Or if you wait long enough, like Hoka does great with their with their meta rocker, you know, and then Saucony comes out and they have a speed roll. You know, Mm -hmm. that's their way of saying the same thing. They're going to come out and they're going to compete with that a little bit more. And um, so we're we're constantly talking to reps. We're constantly seeing like we ordered footwear a while ago for for fall 23. Like we're we're always about nine to 12 months ahead on what's coming out. And um, we're here to help you because a lot of times the news that's coming out is lagging behind the products that are coming out. And then people talk about talk about it on the internet. And that can be a really helpful thing to get more input. But it also can be uh, a little confusing when there's strangers talking about um, issues that might be deeply personal to your gait, to your foot, to your experience, to how you're using the shoe, which might be you know, 6.30 to 7.30 minute pace, uh, minutes per mile on a road, whereas someone got burned by that same shoe, but they're, they're running 11 minute pace on a trail. You know, those are, that's apples to oranges, which kind of reminds me of one of the questions that came in. So we asked for questions about all, all things shoes. Um, Greg on Facebook asked, let me get it up here so I don't misquote him. Hello, Greg, Greg G. Um, he asked, what new shoe update are you the most excited about now this could be something that you most recently have experienced or something in the future that's that's in the pipeline is there anything that's on the top of your radar are you asking just me anybody in the room (laughs) rock and roll um i already mentioned i like the tempest because it's got that um more responsive cushioning but with that stability piece um yeah i'm also i really like my on is it Vistas or Vistas? Yep, the Cloud Vista. Yeah, the Cloud Vista. I've been. I actually have it on, and I took it out to Palm Springs. You have it on. I have the sh- on 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 is on. Cool. Why do you like it? Have you been running in it? Have you been walking? Have you been hiking? Like, what's what's the best use of that shoe for Alicia? Yeah. So this one particularly, like most trail shoes, doesn't have stability. So I'm always cautious to how much I'm wearing it. And obviously, if you're on trails softer surface you don't need all that stability you want your ankle to be able to be a little bit more flexible and move um so i have run it out a few times in the winter just to have more traction like actually on the roads here um but like i love them on actual trails because that's where i'm like not going to get injured with not being in stability yep yeah it like when we went out um to palm springs i feel like that was like the only shoe you brought it was. And, and I think a lot of people's critique of ons, which you're not going to see here, but they kind of have a gap in the bottom. And I hear a lot of people be like, oh, that's like rocks are going to get caught in there. And I personally had no issue with any rocks getting caught just to that's my personal experience. I'm not saying they yeah. can't get caught, but um, I didn't have any issues with that. Yeah, we were a little slow to bring on into the into the store. We've been looking at them for a while. Um, there's been some. I mean, every shoe brand has pros and cons, and we're just and we have a budget and inventory, you know, dollars that we need to keep track of and stuff. But we finally did bring them in. We're super excited about it. I've run in the Monster, which is their high cushion um, shoe. One thing that I like about that one is it has 
a speed board in it. Like you said, it's a little bit more rigid and bouncy. So um, I, I used it for running for a while. Now I use it in the store because it just feels nice and firm. I don't need stability to correct over pronation, but I just feel like it's underneath my foot. I can feel it. It's a firm platform. Um, and they've been really receptive and uh, listen to the feedback. Like when, when you launch a new brand in a new part of the world, they've actually been overseas for a longer time. Um, they've been really receptive to things like snow getting caught in the, um, in the, whatever they're called, the bubbles. <laughs> I just call them the bubbles um, in, in the pockets of, of uh, the clouds. Yeah. The cloud, the cloud pockets. Um, they've also been really responsive to, to actually making shoes without those and the gravel issue um, they've responded to. So we're super optimistic about it. Um, someone also asked like, what's our honest review of on and, and like, why do we bring them in? They've been doing really well uh, for people that, um, you know, might run a lot of miles, but I think their sweet spot is going to be that person that uses them for casual running, um, even if it's their long run as well. And then they're really comfortable to go throughout the rest of your day for. I see a lot of people wear them at work in the medical space on hardwood floors. Um, I wear them here in the store um, on hardwood floors. That's what I have on today. Every time I say the word on, I just feel like there's a pun in there somewhere. I was going to add, they do feel quite amazing, like putting them in. Yeah. yeah, And just standing in them. And I think they're great running too. I don't want to downplay that for me. They do have um, for sure different stability technology and not saying that if you need stability, you can't wear them because you for sure can. I'm just pointing out that it's a little bit different technology and we can go more into that if you'd come in and try them on. And the big takeaway when we bring in a, a new brand is for you guys to actually experience them. This is the first footwear brand that we've brought in since our opening day. Okay. So we're like really confident and really got all the brands we wanted when we launched the store. We got seven footwear brands. And this is the only one that we've added on since since then. Five added and a half years. On. We added on on. Okay. So we're actually gonna have a try on night in March. The month that this podcast is coming out and you're listening to it right now. Not February, Alicia. It's going to be in March. I believe March 16th. Is that right? March 16th, our group runs 6 p.m. down here near the store. We're going to, if the weather's nice, it'll be outside where they have a tent. You can come try them on. (laughs) You get it? Uh, And that'll be all over Facebook, email, Instagram, all that good stuff. Um, Alex, what have you been essentially using as your uh, run lineup, like your shoe lineup, your stable of running shoes. I know we probably have more than the average Mm -hmm. consumer because we work in that world, but what's your daily trainer and what else do you use? Yeah. Um, kind of going back to the shoes, I'm, you know, excited about the, the Clifton nine just came out. Yes. Um, I've been in the Clifton from Hoka for the last three iterations of it. And it's been really helpful for the kind of running that I do. Um, I have the Rincon, which is kind of the uh, lighter cushion, a little, little speedier, uh, little brother of the Clifton from Hoka as well. Been really into the Wave Rider, actually, from Mizuno. Yes. That, um, you know, when we talk about plates and shoes, um, Mizuno's kind of been uh, leading in that innovation for a long years. time. <laughs> long time. Yeah, they've had like a wave plate in their shoe without it being this official racing carbon plate. They've had like wave plates in their shoes for decades. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I think in the past, some of my um, just some of my foot issues with Mizuno is that it's a little bit more narrower. But they've, yep. I think they've taken some of that feedback and mm-hmm. um, and widened it up a bit. I've been really enjoying running in that shoe for a little bit of shorter, speedier efforts. Yep. Um, the glycerin is awesome. That's that's from Brooks. I kind of use that in tandem with um, with the Clifton. I've been. I mean, I, like you said, we obviously have the the. Um, the discount. You can say the discount. <laughs> we have we have the access to more shoes than we have the access to more shoes. <laughs> yes, and, and you know, truly um, experiencing a shoe though, you, right? You know, you kind of. For, for me, um, like I remember the first shoe I actually bought was off of off of the internet. It was off of East Bay. Yep. Um, I remember sitting on my computer, like just like wide eyed, looking at all the options and. Um, it's crazy how night and day difference it is yep. looking at a shoe on your computer versus really trying it on and experiencing it. Um, you know, it, it's almost like they're two totally different things. And I think I really advocate for being able to even putting a shoe on that 
doesn't feel good. Yep. You know, I, when we're doing the fittings here, um, I like to almost have someone put a shoe on immediately and be like, nope, this ain't it. Cause then you know, like, I don't like this width or I don't like this cushion amount. Um, and so, so yeah, I, you know, the more I've kind of, um, expanded my my awareness to more brands and more more options i'm like wow there's there's a lot of really good options out yeah. there and um you know i think i've i've naturally gravitated to hoka but like i love that that more brands are are doing um just having more options for more people and so these are run specialty shoes too like how you touched on there's so many shoes out there i mean like i said if you go to Coles or like they have a athletic shoe section too and what makes us unique is these are run specialty shoes they're meant to log lots of miles they have more cushioning that's why you see the price difference because that's a pretty common question of like well why are these so much more yep. when I can get like a new balance at wherever for 70 you know yep. and yours is 140 well and some brands actually have different tiers of of quality mm -hmm. in shoes like asics is a huge brand new balance is a huge national brand and they they kind of have like a a performance like specialty tier that we trust and then they have some lower you know quality to be honest they have some lower quality shoes that aren't not going to be as durable and not going to be as helpful don't have the same stability um that they'll put in a coles that they'll put in a trade home that they're going to put in a big box store um, there are shoes that almost every brand um, kind of saves and designates for run specialty um, stores like ours, like that are specialty stores, not big box stores. So we do have access to different shoes um, here and there. Even the way that people buy shoes is obviously different than 15 years ago with the internet and everything. And that, and so we, we're constantly adapting, right? We, we have our product online. Um, one of the questions that came through, and by the way, you can always ask a question for the podcast in general, blueox.run slash QA. Blueox.run slash QA is where you get to the form. And um, one of the questions was, do red shoes make me look faster? Yes. All right. Yes. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> 100%. All right. There's that one. Next question. And that was put in by Dr. Moo. Some of you know who Dr. Moo is. And this, is, um, this next one is by Matt Evans which might be the same person, but now he's all serious and using his professor language. At what point does it make sense to get a lighter racing flat? What's the trade-off of the lighter weight? Okay, so a lot of people have a different shoe for their workouts. And when I say workout, I mean a faster track kind of workout or an up-tempo run once a week, maybe twice a week, and then race day. And then their their higher cushion shoe is going to be used for all those other miles throughout the week. When does it make sense? Can't you just do all your runs in one shoe? Yes or no? Yes. Kind of a loaded question, but the answer is yes. You could you can definitely do everything in one shoe. You and honestly, there's probably more models out. I think of the endor for myself. If I could just choose one shoe, only have one shoe. The Saucony Endorphin Shift is very responsive, but it's got enough cushion for my long runs. Um, same thing, something like the Clifton. They used to make something called the Clifton Edge, but the Clifton itself. Big fan of that. Yeah. Um, there's there's different models. Like even the 1080 for me, um, I could get up and go a little bit. The Wave Rider, what um, Alex mentioned before. There's a couple different models that could do everything, but for some people that have um, that are working out faster workouts and trying to run certain paces for the race day, it does make sense to have a lighter, snappier shoe. Um, I would say that's kind of a personal, that's kind of a personal decision. And the purpose to be in it on your workout days um, is to prepare you for race day. It's yeah. not just because I'm faster on workouts, which that's part of it, but part of it is to get your foot used to it so you're not putting on this brand new shoe on race day that you've yeah. practiced in it, you know what it feels like. Totally. And some of it has to do with the paces that people are running. So some of these shoes that have a responsive cushion compound or even a plate in them, they're not kind of this they're kind of not the same shoe if someone's running 10 or 12 minute pace as opposed to five six seven minute pace right like if you're up on your toes a little bit more and actually how fast that gait is happening that response um, and pushback and spring might actually just it's just mechanics like the mechanics of that spring might feel different running nine minute pace as opposed to six minute pace so that's something to consider as well um, is if you're getting up and going a little quicker, that's usually when someone will grab um, a lighter weight shoe. And there's a lot of talk about that carbon plate. Yes. And I want to just touch on 
really quick because please it, do and we can talk so much about it and it's a it's a big buzzword like it's going to make you faster and some of that is true and we won't get in all the details but the true benefit I see of a carbon plate actually talking about workouts and stuff is that quicker recovery um, because it is more responsive it's got that more cushion um, and I don't think that's talked about very much in carbon plate like it does make you recover a little bit quicker I noticed that even it could have just been because it was my second marathon and not my first but I feel like my legs recovered a little quicker yeah because a lot of times that cushion around the carbon plate is is just as important as the plate itself. I think I think carbon plates are um, they have a time and a place. Honestly, they they do have a time and a place. I've used them for a couple of my races. I can tell that it's a really stiff shoe that's bouncing me off the ground a little bit quicker. Um, I think that if people that are using them that depend on running faster times for uh, feeding their family and for earning a living are using them like at the professional level, that's kind of where all this came from, that there's going to be those nuggets of truth and they're, they're, they're going to be helpful in there. But what's unhelpful um, and what's not good is, is just like the barefoot running thing. When we take this nugget of truth and we start to generalize, and I, I'm starting to see people approach carbon plated shoes and even the brands, some of the manufacturers are, are putting plates into training shoes that someone might have in their training lineup for six to seven days a week. And that's where I feel like the jury is still out. That's where we don't have a, a lot of data to see, hey, this faster, tighter, spring-loaded shoe um, might actually be doing damage if you're just using it for slower, easy runs and recovery. Like, what's the purpose of this if you're, if you're going to use it for seven days a week or five days a week? I think that there's a very specific time and place for it. And everything that I've read from a lot of the elites that depend on these for their performance is that they don't train in them because it's basically like an added benefit when it gets to be race day. They might put them on for a specific workout and whatnot, but it's kind of like, would you run all your, would you run all of your um, workouts downhill? You know, would you run all your, your, your runs, even your easy runs, your long runs downhill just to technically have that faster time, but it's not really benefiting you it's it's technically faster but it's not benefiting you or would you just want kind of that downhill tailwind push for race day yes everyone wants that right if they if they want to run faster so and it's the same thing like like we said the minimal we have them we're excited about them too yes like if that's what you're looking for we like them to like come in and try them on see what it feels like yes um same thing. There's a wide spectrum of what's for you. There's a time and a place for them. Anything with the, with the, that, Alex? The durability is also another yes. kind of element that I think is important to remember because, you know, they're not going to be getting the same mileage that your totally. trainers are going to be are going to be getting, and so it kind of leaves this sort of question mark in in terms of its shelf life and you know how how long is this going to last? I I you know. An anecdotal experience ran a race with um, a pair of the Carbon X from Hoka, and it wound up kind of going out on me in the race, and kind of that led to a little bit of a c couple months of rehab and just trying to kind of bounce back from a little nagging injury that kind of started during that effort, um, where you know, kind of pivoting a little bit more t towards you know the general uh, shoe life of or like lifespan of a shoe. Um, you know, when, when the price point is getting higher, you, you want to really get the most out of right. them. Um, and, and I know someone who, I, I mean, he'll recycle his shoes uh, 300 max. And we always say 300 to 500 miles for any, any of our daily trainers. Um, you know, I'm definitely on the, on the side of I want to get the most out of this shoe. Yep. So I'm going to push it as far as I can. But um, I had an issue a couple of weeks ago where I kind of ran, I did a long run in a shoe that was pretty getting close to its its ending point and um, it kind of broke down in the middle of that run and it's kind of led to some some lingering plantar fascia pain that I could have probably avoided had I been yep. a little bit more mindful. But I think that um, shoe like shelf life is definitely an important topic when talking about carbon totally. shoes and just and trainers. Mm -hmm. in general. That's a really good point. There's always a trade off. That's kind of the main message. If you don't hear anything else on the whole episode, it's that there's multiple variables when it comes to being in the right shoe for your foot for your purpose of even that specific run, right. Um, but 
there's always a trade-off. Like you can think about it like cars too. Some of these faster, more nimble shoes are like a finely tuned race car, but that are not going to be good, you know, going on a road trip through the mountains. They, they don't have the durability to do that. Some of these first carbon plated shoes that came out were $250 and they had a hundred mile life lifespan. I think even less than that. Right. You might get two to three max marathons out of it, even if you didn't do workouts. So there's a huge trade-off there. Like dollars per per mile are off the charts for some of this stuff. And for me, that's just not even worth it. Like no one cares about my times. I don't care about my times enough to be like, hey, that added little bit is gonna is gonna be worth a few hundred dollars. But some other people, it is worth it. And that's totally fine. You're an individual, I'm an individual. We, we might value different things. Um, but just be careful about about being really general and saying, oh, carbon is now good. Good for who? Good for what runs? Good for what price? Good for what purpose? Good for what pace? Oh, minimalism, barefoot running is now good and everything else is bad. Well, good for what? Good for who? Good for what run? Good for what purpose? Good for what duration? Good for what surfaces? It's more complex than just putting a rubber stamp on this is the good way and this is the bad way. And that's why Alicia says, we're here to provide all of it, but also the education and sometimes we'll caution people. Like if you've had a running injury and we see you going to less support and less stability and less cushion, we, we don't want to see you get injured again. Like we want to know more information, not because we're challenging your idea, but because we want to see you succeed. We're here to solve problems. Mm-hmm. We're here to listen and get you in the shoe. Ultimately, you want, you're paying for, yes. but we'll give you some guidance in there. Killer. Um, last question. And then we'll kind of wrap it up, right? Last question. What... Oh, that was from before. We already talked about on. Here's the last one. And and people might think this is trivial, but it's not because everyone knows what it means to have your shoe become untied at the wrong time on, uh, on a run, especially if you're trying to lace it back up and it's negative five degrees out. I have issues with my shoes coming untied more frequently th- than before. Not sure if it's the laces themselves or I suddenly lost the ability to tie shoes. Any tips and tricks to try to tying that's not double knotted? So everyone's first reaction is like, tie them tight, put a double knot in them. But I've had this before. Sometimes the laces that come from a certain manufacturer on a certain brand, on a certain model, on a certain year are like really slippery, terrible laces, to be honest. Like we've all had that And I see lace. trends even like right now, they're all like the flat laces yes. where like... Last season, they were all more oval. oval. Yep. And so it they do change. And that is a valid question for sure. Totally valid question. I would say to answer it, I would tuck, um, I would tie nice and tight, double tight. Um, but I'd put it underneath the laces in front. Um, and honestly, um, the other thing you could do is get a lock lace. We sell, they're like a couple bucks. And some people that love them, they swear by them and they don't go back. And some people, a lot of triathletes use them because they go on really quick and you can adjust them, but they lock down and it's literally like a elastic lace. You don't even tie them. So I it's impossible for them to become untied. Like eight to nine, just. Yeah, a couple, couple bucks <laughs> per lace. And then you have two laces because you have two shoes. So it's like a few, it's like a few bucks. <laughs> Good point, Alicia. I appreciate that. Um, anything else besides reminding everyone on running? is coming for you to try on their shoes on March 16th. Stop smiling at me when I say on. It's just, it's unavoidable. Anything else? It's unavoidable. I think we're good. Cool. Well, we're going to wrap it up and be out with the uh, with the old theme song. And next episode will be dropping within the month of March. We're going to try to sneak two episodes in March. Stay tuned to the Blue Ox Running Podcast. What? Two, three, faster, faster slow. slow. Let's, Let's go. go. Fast, 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 fast. What's slow? Let's go. Faster, slow. Let's go. Faster, slow. Let's go. Faster, slow. Let's go. Faster, slow. Let's go.